colorful spread of nigiri zushi looks beautiful and tastes delicious. It's edible art. Sushi is simple, just seafood over rice. But preparing it correctly demands the delicate skill of a trained chef. Sushi came to Japan from Southeast Asia, along with rice agriculture, about 2,000 years ago, and it's been evolving ever since. Sushi is at the heart of Japan's culinary identity, and now it's becoming a popular cuisine around the world. This time, our theme is sushi, what makes it so delicious, and how it has evolved into such a popular food. Hello and welcome to Japanology Plus, I'm Peter Barakan. Today I'm a couple of hours west of Tokyo in a place called Shimizu in Shizuoka Prefecture. Apparently there's more frozen tuna unloaded here in Shimizu than anywhere else in Japan. Now that has a lot to do with the fact that back in the 1920s, canned tuna was born here and went on to be a worldwide hit product. But we concern ourselves not today with canned tuna, but this variety, and don't worry, this one's made out of rubber. After living here in Japan for 40 years, people still fairly regularly ask me, can you eat raw fish? Now, I've never had a problem with it. I know some people don't like the idea of raw fish, but if you go into a sushi restaurant in Japan, you're gonna find it spotlessly clean, there's no fishy smell, and you get a large variety of different kinds of fish which all taste absolutely delicious. Let's start off today with a look at just what sushi is. Sushi is vinegared rice combined with something else usually seafood. The best known type of sushi is called nigiri. The rice is formed into a small lump and a piece of fresh seafood is laid on top. Eating sushi couldn't be simpler. Just dip it in soy sauce and pop it in your mouth. In some types of sushi, the seafood is already seasoned. In that case, there's no need to dip it in soy sauce. Each piece of nigiri sushi is bite-sized. The rice and fish mix in the mouth with just the right balance of tangy and savory flavors. For the Japanese who have been living on rice and seafood for millennia, it's one of the ultimate favorites. The origins of sushi go back over 2,000 years. When rice agriculture came to Japan from Southeast Asia via China, sushi came with it. At that time, sushi involved fermenting salted fish in rice. After a few months, the rice was discarded and only the fish would be eaten. Lactic acid fermentation prevents fish from rotting and converts proteins in the fish into amino acids that give rich flavor. Thus, sushi was originally a method of preserving fish and adding protein to the diet. This kind of sushi was a special cuisine that was prepared for the nobility at festivals and religious ceremonies. But over the centuries, sushi evolved into new and different forms. Around the 15th century, the eating of rice increased among the common people, and sushi also became more widely eaten. Commoners were reluctant to discard the rice, so they ended the fermentation process early before the rice became a paste and ate the rice with the fish. The next leap in sushi evolution came in the 17th century, when a fast and simple method of adding acidity was developed. The key was using vinegar. It was no longer necessary to wait months for fermentation to add acidity. Now, sushi could be made quickly. The third big shift in sushi came towards the end of the Edo period in the 19th century with the birth of nigiri sushi. This style of sushi, eaten at stand-up food stalls, became hugely popular in Edo, as Tokyo was then called. Nigiri sushi, originally a local cuisine of Tokyo, spread to the rest of Japan when sushi chefs were forced to relocate by events like the Great Kanto Earthquake of 1923 and the Second World War. In 
the 1950s, the first conveyor belt sushi appeared in Osaka. While traditional sushi increasingly came to be seen as a gourmet experience, conveyor belt restaurants offered low prices in a casual setting. They spread nationwide in the 1970s. Sushi was originally an import to Japan, but over the ages it's transformed into a symbol of Japan itself. So let's meet our guest for today, who's Mr. Terutoshi Hibino, who's a professor of Japanese culture at Nagoya University of Economics and is also one of Japan's leading sushi experts. Hibino-san, thank you very much for being with us today. I'm looking forward to it. I'm sure it's going to be a very nice day. Thank you for having me. Terutoshi Hibino is an authority on sushi. Over the past 30 years, he studied sushi culture around the country, filling dozens of notebooks with first-hand observations. Now Hibino is chief advisor to the Sushi Museum. He'll tell us about the history of sushi and what makes it taste so good. So they have a sushi museum in here. 15 years ago, to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the opening of the port of Shimizu, the plan to create a sushi museum was launched. It's Japan's first sushi museum. Okay. And we seem to be surrounded by sushi restaurants here. We have a range of different styles of sushi restaurant. There's one I'd like to take you to. It's here. Okay. Let's go. Welcome. Hello. Good to see you. All right. I don't know how many times I've been to sushi restaurants, but there are certain things that I've never been quite sure about. For example, is there a certain order that you're supposed to eat the fish? It's hard to ask somehow, and perhaps it's easier to ask you. People typically recommend starting with fish with a subtle flavor, then moving on to the likes of conga eel, which has a sauce brushed on, and fatty tuna. That's what you usually hear. What about you? I think that wherever you go, it's totally fine to start with the things you like best. Frankly, there's not any set order you have to eat in. Okay. Fine. So, what are we going to start with? Let's see. What's that kind of orangey, pale orange one over there? This may look like salmon, but it's actually a type of trout raised here in Shizuoka. It's called Akafuji, or Red Fuji. Now, another thing I know a lot of people are going to want to ask is, if you look over on the wall there, there's a, a menu of the different fish available. There's no prices written on there. And I think it can be intimidating for a lot of people walking into a sushi restaurant and not knowing how much they're going to be charged. What do you do in a situation like that? At a sushi restaurant, it's all about the fish. The chef goes to buy fish at the market every day, so the tuna may look the same here, but one day it might be a tuna caught in a rough sea and not so good, and the next day it could be a very nice one. The price can fluctuate from day to day, and that makes it impossible to write a set price. Of course, sometimes you are on a budget. In that case, you can say to the chef, today I have a budget of 3,000 yen, or today I've got 5,000 yen. And then you leave it up to the chef. He'll come up with the best selection to match your set budget. Best to leave it up to the professional. Here you are. Thank you. OK. That looks really nice. So, oh, another thing now, I've just dipped that in the soy sauce like that. Mm. Was that the correct way to do it? Mm. That was absolutely correct. You dip the fish part. If you think about it, in the old days, the fish used in sushi was already seasoned. And when they started using unseasoned fish, people started dipping it in the soy sauce. So the sauce is for the fish. Mm. In Japan, there are a number of styles of sushi restaurant. Ones where chefs hand make each piece, and ones where preparation is automated.
prices vary widely as well. There are chains where sushi costs as little as 50 yen a piece. And gourmet establishments where it can be 3,000 yen a piece. Sushi chefs optimize not just the taste, but also the appearance. For example, Japanese tiger prawns have a vibrant red hue. The prawns are plunged into boiling salted water for a few minutes to bring out their red color. Then they're placed in cold water to make the color set. This is a sea bream fillet. Hot water is poured over it, which makes the white flesh stand out. Then it is wrapped in kombu seaweed and left for a day to give it a unique red-tinged gloss. This fish is kohada or gizzard shad. It is butterflied to accentuate the silvery appeal of the skin. Then plenty of salt is sprinkled over the fillets to draw out moisture so that vinegar can penetrate thoroughly. Marinating it in vinegar isn't easy. When preparing a fish like kohada, this step requires the most experience. Kohada treated with salt and vinegar has this beautiful shimmer. Another technique for making sushi look more delicious is decorative cutting. Notches are cut in the back of the kohada. That way, the pale pink flesh will peek through when it is draped over the rice. Sushi looks deceptively simple. Preparing it well actually requires a great deal of skill. Nigiri sushi, at first glance, doesn't seem that special. It looks like just a piece of fish on some rice. But if you look closely at this piece, you can see scoring. It's on both the top and bottom sides. This is to make it easier to eat. Squid, octopus and other firm-fleshed seafood have this hidden scoring for that reason. Okay. Yes, because I know a lot of people that haven't really eaten much mm. sushi, you, you say squid or octopus, and mm. they will automatically think very rubbery, can't bite mm. it. But in fact, it's not the case at all. It's, it's very soft. Uh. Many regions of Japan have developed their own distinctive versions of sushi. This colorful sushi is called Bizen Barazushi, and it comes from Okayama. Big portions of seafood like prawn, squid, and fish are joined by vegetables like peas and ginkgo nuts. Here is Sugata Zushi from Kochi. The silvery skin of fish like mackerel and barracuda is retained so that the fish shimmers as if darting through the sea. Chiyobiki Zushi from the city of Yonezawa in Yamagata consists of neat rectangles of salmon. The red fish and white rice make a color combination considered lucky in Japan. These regional sushi have been made for special occasions like festivals and weddings for generations. Local delicacies for sumptuous celebratory feasts. That idea has inspired a wide range of sushi styles across Japan. So where we are now is a kind of recreation of the very beginning of the 20th century, right? We have a little mm. stand here with some mm. extremely large sushi. <laughs> wow, look at the size of those. Why are they so big? Because pieces of sushi are so small nowadays, we think of that as the standard. But in the old days, they served big pieces like this. This is talk talking about when? This would have been in the first half of the 19th century. That's when the Tokyo style of sushi was invented. Sushi was this big back then. And this stall isn't just for the sake of decoration. It's replicating the actual display. They put it out for the customers like this. You saw one you wanted and stood here and ate it on the spot. Mm -hmm. This is a recreation of the sushi served in those days. Compare it with today's sushi, and you can see the pieces are about three times the size.
and look closely, the rice of the old-fashioned sushi is pink. This is because of the kind of vinegar used in those days. Originally, vinegar was made from rice, which was very expensive. But in the early 19th century, people succeeded in making vinegar from sake leaves. This made cheap vinegar readily available, and it could also be used in making sushi. Vinegar made from sake leaves was reddish in color, which turned the rice pink. Sushi changed to its current smaller size after the Second World War, when Japan was suffering from widespread food shortages. The government ordered pubs and restaurants to close. The Tokyo Sushi Union argued that sushi shops were not restaurants, but establishments offering a craft skill of sushi making. They proposed a system where they offered this service to customers in exchange for rice and a fee. Their exchange rate was about 150 grams of uncooked rice for 10 pieces of sushi. The size of those pieces has remained the standard. One advantage of the smaller pieces was that customers could sample a wider range of toppings at their meal. I'm Matt Alt, and today's episode is all about sushi. Or more specifically, how to make sushi. Sushi is popular all over the world, and the number of tourists who come to Japan specifically to learn how to make it only continues to grow. Well, today, I'm going to go to a specialty school where experts will teach people just like you and me to make sushi like the masters. Let's check it out. Hello. Hello. I hear you're going to teach me all about sushi today. Yes, that's right. Well, now that we're changed, what do we do? How do we start? First, here we have vinegar, a watered-down vinegar. You put it on both hands like this. Okay. Both hands. Now you take some sushi rice, then gently shape it into an oval like this. When you've done that, you pick up your topping. Take the topping and, since we're practicing, just pretend to dab the wasabi on. One touch. Yes. The big difference between nigiri sushi and an ordinary rice ball is that you want to keep some air in the piece of sushi rice. Okay. okay. To make sure there's air in it, you start by making a hole with your left thumb. This is what sets sushi rice apart. I see. Okay. Then, using your index finger, press it down lightly. Push it down. Okay. You press it to form the edges. Sushi should actually stand on these edges. So you turn it over and squeeze gently from the sides like this. Squeeze it. Squeeze it a little bit. That's right. Just a bit of pressure. Next, take your thumb and place it on the sushi's long end. While pressing the rice with your thumb, take two fingers on your right hand and press lightly like this. Okay. Now rotate it clockwise. Squeeze sides and press down. Rotate, squeeze and press. Squeeze and press. So you do it, you do it several times. Usually about three times. Okay. Hi. Your turn. First is the water, of course. So right. Okay. About not too much. Already stuck mm. <laughs> that happens with beginners. Okay. Now take your index finger. <laughs> okay. Squeeze the sides. Press. This is just embarrassing. <laughs> this is completely embarrassing. God, I'm worse at this than dancing or playing music, apparently. Now, let's make a full serving for one. Oh, one plate for one person. Okay. But I guess, you know, it's not just about the taste and the presentation. If you're doing this as business, speed is part of the game too, right? Speed and rhythm. 
You want the customers to appreciate you as you work. The performance element is important. The customer is watching you after all. Cucumbers. Wow. Giving the roll four flat sides makes it look better. So is, is there a, a special way to set them up depending on size or shape? You don't want to put similar colors next to each other. For example, red, white, then red. Or if you create a gradation of colors, the whole plate will look more attractive. Like a painting. Well, the moment of truth, it's time for the big tasting. Go ahead. Well, I guess I'll start with the uh, hamachi here, the uh, yellowtail. Mine, as you can see, has a hole in the top of it and has been pressed into oblivion by my monkey-like hands. But let's, uh, let's give it a try. Um, maybe I pressed it a little too hard. Hi. The rice? Yes. Okay, well, now I'd like to try yours. Hi. Okay, let's try the... Let's try the professional. Mm. Mm. That's really good. That's great. It's more than just about the ingredients. It's how you make it. It's about squeezing just the right amount to form the sushi. The, the, the kind of mouth feel, the, the way it feels in your mouth is completely different. Is that so? Well, there you have it. Now you know that sushi is more than the sum of its parts. Hopefully you can use some of the techniques I learned here today at your next sushi party. Don't forget to invite me. See you next time. These days, sushi is enjoyed around the world. And not just pure Japanese-style sushi, but innovative new kinds of sushi. Like the famous California roll. Wildly popular in the US, it uses avocado in place of tuna. And the rainbow roll with its palette of colorful seafood. There's now sushi with chocolate sauce. And sushi garnished with almond slices. Even sushi sandwiched in a croissant. By combining toppings and sauces, chefs are concocting new sushi creations all the time. Sushi's evolution has gone global. So yet another restaurant. This time it's a conveyor belt sushi restaurant, but. As we can see, the, the belt is here, but there's nothing moving around, which is a little unusual. This is a new form of conveyor belt sushi. There's nothing there right now. The sushi doesn't come until you order it. Okay. That's, That's the touch panel. Oh, all right. In English, too. Oh, it's got English. Okay. Sounds like a good idea. Mm. After these conveyor belt sushi restaurants mm. became popular, it's really changed the whole sushi scene, hasn't it, dramatically? Yes. Before, people didn't know how much they would be charged until the time of payment. But here, the price per dish is fixed. The pricing is very clear-cut. That changed the whole image of sushi, and conveyor belt sushi ushered in that change. But if we think back to when nigiri sushi came along towards the end of the Edo period in the early 19th century, it was made and displayed to customers. That's basically the same with conveyor belt sushi. And they served sushi at reasonable prices. That's another point in common. So I don't see conveyor belt sushi as something new. It's more like it was the rebirth of a forgotten tradition, the return of sushi that was cheap and accessible for everyone. Also, with sushi becoming popular around the world, I mean, especially in America, you've got things like the California roll is the first one that comes to mind, but there are so many different kinds of sushi that, I mean, some of them, I don't even know if you'd really want to call them sushi or not necessarily, but I think they are accepted internationally now as being part of sushi. How do you feel about all of that? Well, as for me, I think it's great. 
People around Japan have made things that taste good to them. That's what sushi is about. So Americans should make the sushi they like. People in Hong Kong, people in Taiwan should make the sushi they like. So, well, yeah, so um, from what, what you've talked about, in, um, you talked about how going back to the Edo period mm. and all the changes up till now, so what comes next? The history of Japanese sushi goes back much further than the Edo period, though, and even when new forms of sushi appeared, the old forms also remained. Here in Japan, for instance, we can still eat funazushi, prepared the way it was 1,200 years ago. And we can also order conveyor belt sushi using a state-of-the-art touch panel. Sushi is really a wide-spectrum cuisine that can cater to all kinds of people, all kinds of preferences. So in the future, I expect even more kinds of sushi will be invented, something that we couldn't even imagine here. I mean, look at chocolate sushi. <laughs> Who knows? In 10, 50, 100 years from now, that might become the standard. Sushi has such versatility. I'm continually struck by the range of possibilities that sushi holds as a cuisine. It's an amazing food. Well, today we've, we've learned about the chef's skills and we've learned the history and all sorts of little details about sushi that I think probably we wouldn't have other known, otherwise known. But uh, it's been even more interesting than I was expecting, so thank you very much. And let's finish off with a little drink, shall we? This goes very well with the sushi. Cheers. Next time, geisha. To this day, they preserve traditional performing arts and bear witness to their role as fashion leaders in centuries past. What is life like for the modern geisha?